Good morning. Good morning. We had the privilege of having some friends over last night, something we haven't done in over a year, uh, something about this COVID-19. I don't know if you've heard anything about it, but <laughs> and uh, they asked me where I was speaking today, and I said, well, I'm going to Freedom in Christ, and I'm very much looking forward to it. I always enjoy coming here, so thank you for having me. I appreciate being here. I've entitled my message this morning, Godly Leaders Need Interceders. And in the only, other than being a bishop or an overseer, I'm also a marriage and family therapist. And in the last year, I've seen, I've met with leaders, some from out of state, uh, from all over. And I've, I've seen leaders become fatigued, uh, leaders wore out leaders that are, are falling into different vices and stumbling. Uh, and I penned this message that I'm preaching to the 13 churches that I oversee, reminding us that godly leaders need interceders. And when I, when I look at some of the challenges leaders face, I just want to name four of them. You probably can identify. And by the way, all of us are leaders in some way, aren't we? If you're a mom or a dad, you're a leader. If you're a grandparent, you're a leader. Uh, wherever you are, wherever God has placed you, people are watching you, you're a leader. And we need to pray for people uh, in, in leadership roles. But one of the things that's changing in our culture is the loss of loyalty. And this is one of the first things that makes leadership very, very difficult. And wherever you are or whatever you're leading, loyalty is being lost. Lions Club struggles to find members. Volunteer fire companies, I was reading an article, volunteer fire companies are struggling to maintain their equipment and even to fight fires because more and more people uh, don't have time for volunteer fire companies. And so we have three sons, uh, 25, 23, and 22. And two of them were at our, ho at our home over Christmas. One lives in Boston. He's going to uh, MIT, working on this thing called a doctorate in theoretical phys physics. And I have no idea what that is. But anyway, uh, it looks cool. And uh, middle-aged middle son, 23, he graduated from Georgetown, and he's working in DC in this thing called cybersecurity. And so they were hanging out at our house, and I was talking about this difficulty of church leadership right now. And, and, and the middle-aged son, Micah, 23, said, Dad, employers aren't loyal to their employees. And he went on to talk about, he said, do you have any idea what it's like for our generation and those who are working at minimum wage jobs? He said, when you were younger, you could plan your week around your work schedule. He said, that's not the way it is for our generation and those who are working a minimum wage job. We get a text, be at work in seven hours. <laughs> How can we plan a whole week of schedule when employers rule us and tell us when to come? And, and it's very, very difficult to, uh, because employers struggle to be loyal to employees. The second thing that I think makes it difficult right now to be a leader is COVID-19. Uh, perhaps you've read an article or six on COVID-19 or heard some things on the news about it. But in church leadership, at least in the Mennonite culture, there are so many layers to leadership. We struggle to empower leaders to lead. Now, my wife is a superintendent of a school district. And and when COVID-19 hit, the school board immediately rallied around her and said, Dr. Musser, we are giving you permission to lead. All we ask is that you keep us informed. And Cacalico has done exceedingly well, my opinion. Of course, I'm biased. But my opinion, Cacalico has done exceedingly well at moving through COVID because a leader is empowered. In our Mennonite churches, leaders aren't necessarily empowered because they have to run something by one committee and then it has to maybe go to another committee and everybody has to weigh in and sometimes we even have congregational votes. COVID-19 threw that hierarchical structure into chaos 
Leaders had to make decisions weekly, monthly, and our church systems are not set up for it. And so a lot of leaders got blamed for a lot of things, and they're wore out. I'm seeing a lot of depression in leaders. I'm seeing a lot of anxiety in leaders. Uh, leadership right now is hard. COVID-19 makes it hard. There are other things that I could go into, but I, I want to spend more time in Scripture. We'll probably touch on some of the things that makes leadership hard. I invite your attention to an Old Testament book called Jeremiah. Jeremiah 38. I'll help you find it. If you open your Bibles to the middle, you'll come to a book, uh, a, a psalm, uh, a number of scriptures there in Psalms. Keep going towards the back of the Bible. You'll come to a thick book called Jeremiah. I invite you to Jeremiah chapter 38. We're going to be looking here, jumping in on this story. And Jeremiah um, had a difficult leadership task. And I'm going to make three points today during, during the message. Um, and I'm going to give them to you, and then you can go to sleep, and I'll wake you at the end. First point I'm going to make is godly leaders are called to speak inconvenient truth. Godly leaders are called to speak inconvenient truth. We're going to see Jeremiah had to speak an inconvenient truth. Second point, godly leaders are sometimes lonely. And if you've ever been a parent or are a parent, you know sometimes you have to give a directive to a child and they don't want to hear it. And they bring up all the ways that their friends don't have to do what you're asking. And it's lonely to hold that line. Godly leaders are sometimes lonely. And finally, the third point is a sermon title, Godly Leaders Need Interceders. Now, before we jump in here at verse 1, I want to give a little bit of background. Jerusalem, this, this city that Jesus rode into on a donkey that Michael read about. Jerusalem in Jeremiah chapter 38 is surrounded by an army. Babylonian army. There's something to know about the Babylonian army. If they surrounded Lebanon, Babylonian army, if they surrounded Lebanon, there are basically two choices for us here today. One, when they take us, they will either kill us or they will take us captive and send us to a city that they are in control of and we would work as slave labor to make them wealthy. Those are the two choices. Babylonians did not have a reputation where you want to surrender to them. Now listen to what Jeremiah tells the people. Chapter 38, Jeremiah chapter 38, beginning in verse 1. Shepatiah, son of Matan, Gedaliah, son of Pasher, Jeuchol, son of Shelemiah, and Pasher, son of Malchah, heard what Jeremiah was telling all the people when he said, this is what the Lord says. Whoever stays in this city will die by the sword, famine, or plague. But whoever goes over to the Babylonians will live. He will escape with his life. He will live. And this is what the Lord says. This city will certainly be handed over to the army of the king of Babylon who will capture it. Jeremiah spoke an inconvenient truth a truth that no one wanted to hear. Surrender to this army. This army who had a reputation for slitting your throat, killing you, or taking you captive and making you work for them. We can well imagine that the people were not thrilled to hear this message, and we're going to read about that shortly. As godly leaders, we must speak inconvenient truth. Moms, dads, listen to me. If you allow your child to go and do whatever they want to do, your child, A, might have a very short life because playing in the streets are not exactly safe. Unless, of course, it's a dead-end one like this. 
But you'll have to speak inconvenient truth. And it brings pain. And it brings sometimes a temper tantrum. No, you may not have that Kit Kat bar. And a child melts down in a grocery store. And I just enjoy watching this, now that I'm no longer a parent to that age, when the child melts down and I, and I watch the parent ignore the meltdown and just keep right on shopping. I love it because I know that that child is being parented not according to what they want, but according to what they need. This is an inconvenient truth. And many of us as parents, we get all worked up when our child gets worked up. How many have been there? I, I, I've been there. Been there. Child gets worked up, and, and I begin to think, well, what can I do to, and my wife, oh, my goodness, if you've ever met her, she's a, she's a gem. She, that's the way it is. And she's told me over and over, like, Dave, are you parenting for the moment, or are you parenting for the future? She can hold the line. I'm a softy. Actually, there's a little bit of a story behind that. If you know anything about at all about personality profiles, we're all different, right? We're all different. Well, there are two types of people when it comes to decision making. There are those who make decisions based upon fact from the head. And there are those who make decisions based upon feelings. How is this affecting everybody? My wife makes decisions from the head. These are the facts. And I come along and I see the tears and I think, well, maybe we could give a little bit. She holds the line. Godly leaders are called to speak inconvenient truth. And I have one this morning. One that deeply concerns me. I don't know if you've noticed our culture lately, but we are becoming a polarized people. We can't even talk about mass, for example, without becoming polarized. It is very difficult to lead in a culture where it is all or nothing thinking. If you don't agree with me on all points, then I can't associate with you. And our populace is becoming polarized. And it is not going to get better. Again, our sons are home. And I'm talking about this. And Micah, again, 23 years old, he's in cybersecurity. He says, Dad, you know why that is. Well, I wanted to spiritualize it right away. And he said, well, that may be true. But there are algorithms on our computers and on our search engines. And the moment you Google a theory and you begin reading it, the algorithm reads it and says, oh, here's a person that's interested, for example, in flat earth theory. Do you know there is something like that? It's called flat earth, the flat earthers. They, they believe the earth is flat and it's growing in credibility. It's growing in credibility, I put in quotes. It's growing in popularity. If you begin to search flat earth theory, the, your computer will read that and say, well, here's a person who's interested in reading about flat earth theory. And so they'll pump more articles to you. And they'll give you all the arguments to come against satellite pictures that show the earth is round. They'll give you arguments as to how it's a government conspiracy to convince you that the earth is round. And the more you read about it, the more the algorithms pick it up and will feed you that story. That becomes your narrative. I don't mean you, but anyone who is doing that. That will become the narrative. And you'll have all the arguments. A few examples. Uh, not that long ago, a number of months ago, I was working with somebody who, who um, came to me because they were being crowd-stalked. Crowd-stalked. It's the first time I ever heard of it. 
And um, between the first and the third time of meeting this person, I had done some research. And crowd stalking basically is um, if you're driving down the road and maybe there are three white cars or three white vehicles that you pass, you can be assured that the government has sent them and they are watching you. And there's a lot of anxiety that a person carries who believes that they're being crowd stalked. Well, before I had done adequate research on it, I began to see some paranoid thinking. And this was me genuinely caring for this person. I started to see some paranoia. And so in, in, in the last session I, or uh, time I saw this person, I, I, said, I wondered, have you ever struggled with paranoia? She was gone. Never heard from her again. Because deep within the narrative of crowd stalking is the phrase, if anyone suggests you have paranoia, they are from the government and they are part of the conspiracy theory, or they are part of the crowd stalking. And by not knowing that, I ended a relationship in my attempt to help deal with a conspiracy theory. How do we, when we become so inundated with one narrative and all or nothing thinking, how do we even communicate with each other? And this is becoming real and our churches are seeing it. Uh, I've been called into the conference has asked me to get involved in certain situations where it is becoming very real and churches are dividing. Why? Because of one narrative that people buy into and everybody else is part of a conspiracy against me. We are becoming polarized people. An example of algorithm, these algorithms, kind of a funny example, one day I was on my computer and I was on Google, I was searching something and up pops an advertisement for dresses. That's interesting. And they're beautiful and uh, beautiful professional clothing for, for females. And so I didn't think anything of it and a few days later boxes started arriving on our front porch. And here, <laughs> COVID had shut down my wife from going shopping in brick and mortar buildings and she had begun to shop online. Fascinating, but Google somehow has an algorithm that placed my computer in proximity to her computer and thought, well, if this person's buying female clothes, this person has to be interested too. And so now I have all kinds of ads on my, on my Google feed for buying uh, professional female clothing. They're nice, but really I'm not interested. So, <laughs> But it's amazing, the technology. And this is what I'm talking about. The inconvenient truth that I have for the church today is stop your news feeds. It is way too much propaganda and not enough news. We were talking recently with some friends and they said, you know, we remember when we were younger, and this, <laughs> tell by my gray hair, that's back when the dinosaurs were around. But when we were younger, on the news channel, it was 20 minutes of news every evening. Done. Now it's 24-7. And, and we're not just getting the news, we're getting an interpretation of that news. So I ask you this question, individually. Where do you spend more time, in word feed or news feed? Because if we don't arrest this, we are going to become more and more divided and polarized as a people because more and more narratives are going to be driven to us and at us. And when I'm saying this to the churches, not everybody's happy with me. 
Because by the way, there's only one political party that will ever go to heaven, according to some narratives. And that's a lie. Jesus Christ died for all. So I ask you, are you more involved in word feed or news feed? And if it's news feed, you have the potential to become fed a narrative that is figured out by algorithms on your computer. And you will become more and more polarized from reality. Turn off the news feeds and turn on the word feed. Jeremiah's message to the people was surrender. These Babylonians are going to take this city, but if you surrender, you will live. Not a popular message. Verse 4, then the officials said to the king, this man should be put to death. He is discouraging the soldiers who are left in this city as well as all the people by the things he is saying to them. This man is not seeking the good of these people, but their ruin. Listen, verse 4, uh, this, doesn't, this fits in between points. Verse 4 is truth and a lie mixed. They are right. This man is discouraging the soldiers. That's truth. He was. Because he was saying, you're not going to stand against this Babylonian army. But notice, they judged his motive. He is trying to ruin the people. No, he was not. And too many news organizations do what Adam did in the garden. Adam told a lot of truth. God says, where are you? <laughs> and Adam says, we heard you walking in the garden. That was true. We were naked. That was true. We were afraid. That was true. So we hid. That was true. But what was the truth that was omitted? The biggest truth of all. We ate of the tree you told us not to eat of. That was absent. And when I look at news feeds today, I see partial truth being pushed but, and interpreted. And we are buying it. Rat poison. Listen to me carefully. If you buy rat poison on your way home from here today, stop in a hardware store and buy rat poison, you will notice that on the ingredients, 99.98% of that rat poison is good food. 0.02% is poison. And that is how Satan deceives the saints. He gives mostly truth, but omits significant parts of, the, of, of truth. And it becomes a lie. And we stumble. This is partially true. This man is discouraging the soldiers. That is true. But when they said this man is not seeking the good of these people, but their ruin, that's a lie. Jeremiah had the good of the people in mind. And when godly leaders speak inconvenient truth, they are speaking with the good of people in mind. You do it as parents. I want Michael to do it as a godly leader. And I want to be able to do it as a bishop. Why? Because we love people. We love you. Verse 5. He is in your hands, King Zedekiah answered. The king can do nothing to oppose you. So they took Jeremiah and they put him into the cistern of Malchahah, the king's son, which was in the courtyard of the guard. And they lowered Jeremiah by ropes into the cistern. It had no water in it, only mud. And Jeremiah sank down into the mud. I don't know if you're familiar with cisterns. Um, that's a word that maybe we don't use very often anymore. But a cistern is basically a deep pit where uh, water is, is collected and used during times of need. And so uh, some of the homes that we built when I worked construction, we would maybe under the front porch make a tank. And all the, all the spouting, all the water coming off the roof, we would direct into the cistern. And it would be held there and used for washing clothes or flushing toilets. You didn't drink it, but it was used for that kind of thing. That's a cistern. Well, this, this apparently was a hole in the ground, a cistern where water would have been collected. And when you look, standing at the top, and you look into a cistern, 
at least one that's deep enough you cannot see the bottom. You don't know where the bottom is. Jeremiah was left down in this cistern not knowing where the bottom was. And when he hit the bottom, there was no water, only mud. The kind of mud that the more you fight it, the deeper you sink. I have met leaders this year that are in the mud. And they don't know how to get out. And they don't know how long they're going to be there. And it is lonely. It is lonely. Parents, if you've ever gone through a difficult time, um, we met with... uh, El and I are in communication with some dear friends. Uh, Their child is going through depression and anxiety. Uh, If you ever have a child that's going through depression and anxiety, you're a lonely parent. Because that child, if they're talking to you, they might even be talking about ending their life or cutting. And there isn't a thing you can do other than be there with them. It's a lonely time as a parent. Anybody who has struggled with that knows what I'm talking about. Incidentally, or or, uh, interestingly enough, uh, I supervise other therapists. So um, I don't know how many now I supervise, but I was meeting with one last week. And uh, it's a female, and she said, in the last three days, I had two, uh, three parents, two for 13-year-olds and one for an 11-year-old that are struggling with anxiety and depression. And that's a common theme that we're starting to see in marriage and family therapy and counseling. Younger and younger children struggling with anxiety and depression. And I have all kinds of theories as to why that is, social media being a big one, not the only one. Anyway, that's... I'm not teaching on marriage and family therapy. My point is, as a godly leader, sometimes you are lonely. When you speak an inconvenient truth, don't expect people to give you a hug. They might want to kill you, which is what they wanted to do with Jeremiah. Verse 7, But Ebed Melech, a Cushite, an official in the royal palace, heard that they had put Jeremiah into the cistern. And while the king was sitting in the Benjamin gate, ebed Melech went out of the palace and said to him, My lord the king, these men have acted wickedly in all they have done to Jeremiah the prophet. They have thrown him into a cistern where he will starve to death when there is no longer any bread in the city. I am going to assume that all of you here today are verse 7. I'm going to assume that all of you are Ebed Melix. And we have a king. And that king is all powerful. That king is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the creator of everything we see. And we, you and I, have direct access to that throne through the blood of Jesus Christ. Ebed Melek did not go first to Jeremiah and say, hey, dude, hey, buddy, I'm going to go talk to you. Jeremiah had no idea who was interceding for him. Ebed Melek went straight to the king. He went straight to the one who has the power. And I'm going to assume that you all are doing that for each other that you are interceding first for Michael and Deborah, secondly for the elder team and any leaders who are here, that we are interceding for them because it's a lonely role. It's a lonely place to be in leadership. I oversee a church called Ayersman Mennonite in Lancaster County, Mannheim. I know Michael and Deborah, you're familiar with Ayersman. Uh, I think you spoke there a few times, if that's correct, yeah. Ayersman Mennonite last summer uh, did a campfire. They they have a place there at their church that they did a campfire for everyone and um, invited all their leaders there. And Ellen and I were not able to go. We had another commitment. But one while they were around that campfire, they, they took 
little glass jars and people wrote down uh, words of encouragement and filled the glass jar with lots of sayings of encouragement. Sunday that I got there, I was presented with one of these glass jars. And there are about four or five messages still in that jar. I don't read one every day. I read one the days when I am lonely. And I take one out and I read it. And I know that there are people who are interceding for me. I want to encourage you to do that for Michael and for your leadership team. Take a glass jar or some text a message of encouragement, maybe this week, maybe next week, but don't wait too long or you'll forget it. But let him know and them know that you are interceding for them. Verse 10, then the king commanded he bed me like the Cushite. Interestingly enough, this man was not even an Israelite. He was not an Israelite. He was a foreigner. Take 30 men from here with you and lift Jeremiah the prophet out of the cistern before he dies. 30 men. <laughs> he must have been stuck in the mud to need 30 men. So ebed melech took the men with him and went to a room under the treasury in the palace. He took some old rags. Listen, this is a detail we wouldn't need to be given, but we are given this. He took some old rags and worn out clothes from there and let them down with ropes to Jeremiah and the cistern. ebed melech the Cushite, said to Jeremiah, put these old rags and worn out clothes under your arms to pad the ropes. ebed melech cared so much about his leader he didn't even want ropes to burn him. I imagine if you take 30 men and you yank somebody, you're going to have rope burns. And, and Ebed Melech said, I, I want to keep that from happening. Jeremiah did so, and they pulled him up with the ropes and lifted him out of the cistern. And Jeremiah remained in the courtyard of the guard. Now, if we were to follow this story, and today I'm not going to, soon after Jeremiah comes up out of the cistern, King Zedekiah invites him for another sit-down, a coffee, perhaps. And he says to Jeremiah, I'm going to paraphrase, what's your new message for me? <laughs> and Jeremiah's message did not change. He said, surrender, and you will live. Parents, I want to encourage you as leaders when you draw that line with your child, I don't care the age, one-year-old, 11-years-old, 14-year-old, and you draw that line and they throw a fit, when they come back around and ask you again, hold the line. Hold the line. You're not going to be popular. But if you got into parenting to become popular, you're going to fail in those moments. But afterwards, after you hold the line and you do so, as that child grows, they will respect you. They will respect you. Jeremiah's message to Zedekiah did not change. It was the same. Throw me in a cistern, hate my guts, but here's the inconvenient truth. And Jeremiah kept going with consistency. Hugely encouraging for me. As, as a leader that's attempting to be godly. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for freedom in Christ. I thank you for Michael. The things that the cisterns from which you have pulled him and the way that his message is being consistent. It's not a message of I'm against you, I hate you, though it may seem that way at times to certain people. But it's a message because he cared, cares deeply for his people. Bless him. Bless the leadership team. That they would become unified around the cross of Jesus Christ. May all the narratives of the world flow off of their shoulders. And they become and remain faithful to your love and your love for the people. 
bless this congregation in Jesus' name.